Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's information session hosted by FIU in Washington, DC and FIU's uh, Office of uh, Prestigious Scholar Development, as well as our good friends at the Howard University Bunch Center uh, that run the, the, the amazing uh, Wrangell, Payne, and Pickering programs. I appreciate you joining us bright and early on the first few hours of this work week after a uh, hopefully enjoyable Labor Day weekend and, and nothing better to do off of that than learn about these amazing graduate school and career pathways into the federal government. My name is Eric Feldman from FIU in Washington, DC, and I'm glad to introduce this session. For those of you who may not have uh, participated in an FIU in DC event before, a little bit about us, if you might not have been as aware of our, our role here at the university. We're part of FIU's Office of Governmental Relations. We are based here in the nation's capital to do a few things. One, to uh, work on solutions to the nation's toughest problems by connecting FIU researchers to our congressional partners and our federal agency partners to form uh, funding opportunities and research partnerships and to, to advocate both for our research themes but also to student support initiatives to make sure FIU's uh, financial aid situation and student access programs, uh, especially those with federal partnerships, are, uh, are well taken care of. Our idea exchange is a series of events that we do to position FIU as a thought and so, uh, conversational leader among the nation's decision makers. So this is where we not only bring together students and faculty, but we bring together students and faculty and think tank uh, researchers and federal government officials and advocacy group leaders to discuss everything from uh, environmental challenges to health disparities challenges to the future of cybersecurity and STEM education, uh, really making sure RFIU has this great reputation uh, here in DC. And what you're experiencing today is part of our talent lab programming. Our talent lab is everything that we do for our students and our alumni to land internships, to land jobs, to land fellowships like those that we're, we're talking about uh, today. Um, another really great part of our talent lab programming uh, that you happen to be really good timing to learn about if you happen to be on this call and are still a current student. But we're well known for our DC fly-in programs, three-day experiences in Washington, DC. Those programs uh, have not stopped for the fall. They are virtual and there are two open for applications right now that I must tell you about. One is in partnership with our Black Student Union. The title of this fly-in is Breaking Generational Barriers to Black Leadership. We're exploring this topic both on the entrepreneurial and business side with both uh, Black business owners from the DC area and federal agencies that support minority-owned businesses to um, uh, congressional visits that deal with uh, those members that are working on uh, racial justice and equity legislation right now. That's gonna be a fantastic program. We also have another very timely program. This one is called um, The Future of Equity in Health and Beyond COVID as a Catalyst for Change. It will be similar in format in terms of dealing with congressional visits, federal agency interactions, nonprofit advocacy groups, everyone that's relevant in DC to this topic and it's exploring how the current pandemic that we're in might accelerate the race to close critical gaps in health, education, economic equality, uh, um, um, and how all those things intersect and how the 2020 election will play a role and what the outcome of that election might change from, the, from that topic. So um, both of these fantastic opportunities, you can go to one simple website, flyin.fiu.edu to read more about and apply uh, to both of them. The deadlines are one this week, one next week. Definitely encourage you to check that out, flying.fiu.edu. I'm so happy to introduce today's presenters and keep their introduction short so we can get right into the, the meat of this content of how to apply to these fellowships. Um, but thank you to all these people for being here. Uh, Patricia Scroggs is the director of the Wrangell Fellowship, which is one of the three uh, programs we'll be talking about today. Maria Vivas House is director of the Payne Fellowship, another one of the programs. They will also be discussing the Pickering Fellowship. Um, they are both at Howard University's Bunch Center, which runs uh, these programs. Fantastic operation. Uh, couldn't be happier to, to, to share the city of Washington, D.C. with them and to have their partnership here. Um, as a very special guest, uh, we will be closing out with David Rodriguez, political officer at the U.S. Department of State, FIU alumnus and Wrangell Fellowship Program alumnus. 
Uh, so thank uh, you for being here, David. I'm not on the call today, but to know that, that she is at FIU now, Dr. Ashley Coons is the Director of Prestigious Scholar Development. So she's here for programs like the three of these and all other nationally prestigious and competitive awards. She can help you with her, your applications and her um, information uh, is there, ashley.coons at fiu.edu. And um, I believe joining us uh, as a guest, and you should know she's here as well, Rebecca Cumbrell is our diplomat in residence for the U.S. Department of State. So anyone interested in any State Department internships or careers should reach out to her at dirsouthflorida at state.gov. I'm going to turn it over to our presenters now. I want to take a, make a quick note to ask everyone to introduce themselves in the chat as we get started. Let us know why you're here, today, which program you're interested in, your, your FIU affiliation, what makes you passionate about these things, anything you want us to know about you in the chat, and ask uh, questions in the chat anytime during the program. I'll keep an eye on them. Um, I'll make sure they get addressed uh, by our panelists uh, at the end. Um, and, uh, you know, please feel free to, to ask questions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the way. I'm going to turn it over to Maria and Patricia to, to uh, get us started here. Excellent. So Maria, would you mind if I start? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Patricia Scroggs and I'm the Director of Diplomatic Fellowships at Howard University. I oversee both the Wrangell and the Pickering program at uh, Howard University. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a little bit about them. Um, I usually like to start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and have been doing this job since, for the past 15 years. I love representing these fellowships and I really enjoyed my time in the Foreign Service. That's important because the fellowships that we're going to talk about lead to careers in the Foreign Service. For um, Wrangell and Pickering, it's State Department Foreign Service for uh, USAID. Uh, for uh, Payne, it's USAID Foreign Service. There is a five-year service obligation, so you really should think through whether or not this is something uh, of interest to you. I myself loved it. Um, I, I always love to talk about it, but I will tell you two things that I think uh, were really important to me. The first one, is that if you're one of those people that has uh, a lot of different interests, I always say I'm intellectually restless, which means I really can't decide what I wanna do for the rest of my life. The State Department or USAID are wonderful careers. Every couple of years we change places, we change issues, we get lots of training. And so if you're always looking for a new challenge, it is a wonderful thing to do. And the second thing that I think really matters is that what we do makes a difference. Whether we're trying to promote human rights overseas or combat trafficking in person. Or um, resolve people overseas. Next, please. Okay, so I want to do a quick overview of the Wrangell program. The Wrangell program came into uh, effect in 2002 as a way to promote excellence and diversity in the Foreign Service. Uh, our Foreign Service was not particularly diverse. There are two uh, components. Uh, we have a graduate fellowship, which is going to be what I talk about mostly today, and an undergraduate uh, international affairs summer enrichment program. Um, very briefly, the um, uh, Wrangell Undergraduate Summer Enrichment Program is a uh, six-week program and happens in Washington, D.C. So if you're an undergraduate, you can be a sophomore, junior, or a senior on February 9th, 2021, you can um, apply for the um, undergraduate program. Um, it's six weeks to look at careers in foreign affairs. So we'll see State Department, we'll go to USAID, we'll go to some of the intelligence agencies, you'll take classes, we do a lot of professional development. Uh, so you'll get uh, more comfortable with negotiating and group dynamics and speaking and professional writing. Um, by the time the six weeks is over, our goal is that you have a better idea of what you want to do and how to get from here to there. The programs also recognize that um, not, you know, that uh, there is financial need, and so they provide room, board, tuition, transportation, and we give a stipend of three thousand two hundred dollars to um, uh, help replace income. 
So it's a wonderful program, interested in international affairs, undergraduate student, just want to learn something about it. Uh, so again, it's February 9th, 2021 to apply, and you can find it on our Wrangell website. Okay, so um, the Graduate Fellowship itself. So the Wrangell Graduate Fellowship, again, was um, formed to create a more diverse foreign service. We know that when you get people with diverse backgrounds around a table, you make better decisions. We know that when you're, we're uh, out overseas, um, that it's really important that we share the uh, diversity, which is one of the major strengths of the United States. So many of the issues that we deal with overseas have to do with the lack of tolerance or being able to um, integrate people uh, based on religion or um, ethnic group or whatever. So I think it's really important that we um, have this included uh, in our own foreign service. So let's talk briefly about the fellowship. The fellowship pays $42,000 a year towards your graduate school. In addition, um, it'll pay about 11,000 per summer for um, your internships. Uh, you can go to any good two-year graduate program in an area of relevance to the foreign service. You can do a master's in foreign policy, a master's in international affairs, a master's in public policy, a master's in business administration, just something that is relevant to the work of the Foreign Service. Uh, master's in, uh, let me see, like medicine, no, would not be. Um, it has to be a US university. So again, it's 84,000 over the two years plus the 11,000. Altogether, the award's worth about 106,000. Uh, we have an orientation uh, to the program that begins in May. We have uh, a congressional internship uh, the first summer, and then we have an overseas internship the second summer. You receive two mentors, not just one, but two mentors for the program so you learn about the Foreign Service and develop a relationship. And when you graduate from uh, the program, you join the Foreign Service. So that's what's really special about these uh, fellowships, is that if you get the fellowship, you get the job in the end. There's only one reason that wouldn't happen. That would be if you couldn't get a, um, you couldn't get all of your clearances. Those are medical security and suitability. And please know that there is a five-year service obligation. So you should really want to go into a foreign service in order to do this. Next, please. Uh, just very briefly, the deadline for the rank of fellowship this year is October 14th. Um, November 17th is when we will uh, select 90 finalists. We're really excited this year. We're increasing by 50%. So rather than having 30 fellows, which is what we normally have, we're going to have 45 this year. So there's more opportunities than ever before. And we will have 90 finalists. Uh, normally we bring you to Washington, but this is not a good year for that. So everything will take place in terms of our selections virtually. We're going to interview uh, December 2nd and 3rd. And if you're selected as a finalist, we'll give you lots of information to prepare. And then on the 4th, our panel decides and we will tell you the same day. We will look at your application for the first part, and these are some of the elements in it. After that, you get um, evaluated based on your interview and a writing exercise. The eligibility requirement for the Wrangell Fellowship is US citizenship, a GPA of 3.2, and planning to enroll in graduate program for fall 2021. Next, please. So the Thomas Pickering program is very similar to the Wrangell program. And I always think it's interesting that the State Department has two programs that are very similar. The money is exactly the same. It's 42,000 a year, 84,000 in total. Um, the only difference is that the domestic internship for the Pickering program is at Maine State uh, in Washington, DC. Whereas for the Wrangell program, it's on Capitol Hill. However, because everything else is the same, you're going into the Foreign Service, you're going you're getting the same amount, you're getting the same mentorship. We actually run both programs. Um, the application is almost identical. So if you're applying to one, you can apply to both really easily. The selection panels are different, so they will not know that you are, send, that you are giving in the exact same application. Really, the only thing you need to do is change Wrangle to Pickering. That will be different when you talk about pain because pain is a different type of um, the, the final uh, location is at the USAID Foreign Service, and that's different from State Department Foreign Service. So you don't necessarily want to use the same one for that, but you can use the same for both of these. Next. Uh, their uh, selection timeline is about a week behind ours. So uh, the application 
will close on October 21st. They're going to pick their finalists November 24th. They're interviewing December 15th through 17th, and they'll pick people by December 18th. Again, in doing this, we'll have 90 fellowships between the two programs. So this is a great year to apply and to apply to both. Next, please. And this is tips for preparing a competitive uh, application. Uh, I'll go through these really briefly, but I'll be glad to talk more about it. Most important thing is look at the uh, State Department career website because it's going into State Department and Wrangle program. Realize if you're eligible and that this is something you wanna do. Write a good statement of interest. A good statement of interest, I think, answers three questions. Why do I wanna be a Foreign Service Officer in the State Department? That is a different question than why am I interested in international affairs? You, so you want to know something about State Department. Second is what do I bring? And that's bringing all of your experiences together. So it can be experiences, skills, background. It says this is, this is why I think I would be uh, successful in this career. And the third one is not a separate part, but I think it's in there, which is who am I? It's a personal statement. You should show us a little bit of, of who you are and what you value in the way you talk about your motivations and your preparations. Uh, we have a 350 word essay that's gonna demonstrate planning and organizing skills. This year we asked you to write a short essay about a uh, time that you had to make a decision and how you made the decision. Um, academic ability and rigor, we're gonna look at your transcript. Uh, obtaining strong letters of recommendation, you get one from a community leader and that's somebody that knows you in a non-academic way and one from um, an academic. The most important thing here, pick people that know you and like you. Sometimes you feel like you need to get the big name, but don't. If it's, a, if it's an adjunct professor who knows you the best, have the adjunct professor write. If it's a supervisor at work, have that rather than your member of Congress who you don't know. Again, people that know you and like you and you can give them, you know, remind them of you know, things that you have done with them so they can write a good letter of recommendation that really talks to this opportunity. It should not be generic. Um, you're gonna demonstrate the need for financial assistance by filling out the FAFSA SAR. And this is 2021-2022 this year, which opens October 1st. So you're gonna to have to fill it out then. Um, and then um, you're gonna write a 400 word essay and give us the background on your financial need. A FAFSA you know, gives us a few data points, but it doesn't, un, the numbers don't tell everything. So this is where you can tell us about your background. This is where you can tell us about you know, things that are not obvious. You know, your family's not gonna support you when you're in graduate school. You had to work while you uh, were in graduate school. You picked the graduate school, I mean, you picked the undergraduate school that you did because of financial reasons. So maybe you don't have a lot of debt, but quite honestly, that's one of the, the reasons that you picked the school, besides the fact that FIU is an excellent school. Um, add all your extracurricular, community, professional, volunteer experiences, highlight engagement and leadership. If you can use a good action verb to talk about your uh, involvement, you know, certainly if you were president, but also if you organized a, an event or you spearheaded the fundraising drive, let us know that you're not, don't just list them, let us know how engaged you were. Include all your relevant college, university, or professional honors and awards, and please, please, please proofread all of your application. You are applying at a very high level and you want your whole application to be good. And then submit all materials online um, and on time. And you can check for your letters of recommendation. So that is the thing that's, that most often does not come in. You can check to see whether your recommenders uh, put in the recommendation. This is a great opportunity to work on your um, diplomatic skills, trying to get them to, to send it in on time. Next, please. And off to Maria to talk about the Don Payne program. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And Thank you for your interest in these amazing fellowship opportunities. I truly hope that we get good candidates from FIU because we have never had a fellow from FIU. I wanted to change that. Uh, fun fact, uh, the actual head of uh, USAID is a Panther. Acting Administrator John Barza went to FIU and got a bachelor's in international relations. So you can be in good company. 
The Donald Payne International Fellowship Program is very similar to Wrangell. It actually has, I don't know why I'm not able to move the slides. Let's see. Oh, here we go. It was a little delayed. It's very similar to the Wrangell Fellowship. Uh, the award is up to 96,000 over two years for tuition fees, living expenses, and including the summer internships. You have an orientation to the program and to USAID's Foreign Service in Washington, DC, and you spend the first summer before you enter graduate school at Howard University. And then after orientation, you go and have your internship on Capitol Hill. It's a very rewarding experience because you will be sharing the space with the Pickering and the Wrangell Fellows, and that will constitute a unique opportunity to create your network. And these friendships that are bonded uh, through this 10 week internship are really strong, and you will probably end up serving in similar posts. So uh, that's a, it's a good way to start your professional career. After that, you will have a 10-week overseas internship at a USAID mission where you will be able to see and experience what an FSO at USAID does. You will receive mentoring with a Foreign Service offering uh, officer, and this will be two mentors, one the first summer and the second one the second summer. And after you complete the fellowship and graduate, you will have employment with the USAID Foreign Service. Uh, it's a five-year commitment as well, and you will have to pass the medical and security clearance. These are the countries that USAID operates in. Uh, as you can see, it's all developing countries. There are about a uh, hundred countries that have some sort of presence with USAID. A lot of them are bilateral missions, but there's also some regional offices that take care of countries that USAID does not have an office. But if you apply to this fellowship, you will know for sure that you're gonna be working in a developing nation. What is a USAID foreign service officer? These are the backstops. So we're looking for people who have several technical skills as well as just general program management skills. And these are the 12 backstops that uh, you can apply to. If you are interested, for instance, in a health degree, you can become a health officer. Or if you're interested in working in economic development and trade, you can become an economist. There's also education officers and environmental officers, private enterprise officers that are trying to build the private sector in these developing countries, as well as crisis stabilization and governance officer because we are dealing with a lot of countries that are politically unstable. There's also some infrastructure work. So if you are an engineering officer, you will be working with partners in our partner countries that are working on infrastructure development too. And the executive officer, the contract and the program officer and financial management officer are all support uh, positions for, for the other technical officer. Some of the common graduate degrees that we support are these. As you can see, it's very wide and anybody that has an interest in STEM can definitely apply to our fellowship program. Um, we are looking for people who are interested in making an impact overseas. They're uh, willing to um, go to areas that are, in some, some of them are maybe unstable or might be uh, needing support in humanitarian assistance. So we are also looking for that. Our selection process and timeline is the following. We are a little bit later than the Pickering and the Wrangell. Uh, we will have our deadline on November 1st, so you have some time to prepare your application. Please start as soon as possible because it does take some time. We have a personal statement requirement as well as the financial statement requirement. And please spend as much time in the personal 
as well as the financial statement because we want to see that your whole application is one coherent narrative. The selection of finalists is in December and our interviews, which this time are gonna be virtual as well, will be beginning January and you will have a decision by January 15th. So uh, you will be able to then apply or I advise that you apply at the same time that you're applying for, for the fellowship to graduate school. We no longer have a GRE requirement, so that is something that we did away because we don't want any obstacle impeding those that are under financial strains that, uh, to, to apply. The eligibility is pretty much the same, US citizenship, 3.2 GPA, and planning to enroll in graduate program in the fall of 2021. Um, I don't want to belabor the point as uh, Patricia covered most of it. I just want to highlight the two aspects that we are very much looking for, the relevant te technical experience in the field. And uh, we have had a lot of success in Return Peace Corps volunteers who apply to the program because they have technical experience in the field. But we also want people who, you know, come directly from undergraduate. And technical experience that we're looking for in that case is if you had been a leader in implementing a new program that had had an impact and had benefited many people, um, that you show passion for international affairs and international development specifically, and that you also have strong writing skills. We have a writing exercise for the finalists and we look very closely to your writing skills. And this is our contact information. So um, I, I believe Eric is going to share the presentation afterwards. So please feel free to contact any of the programs. We are here to help you and be successful in your application. We are also going to have the webinars available. Go to our website. And you can also register for those who are starting uh, an application and have any specific questions, we have office hours as well. So please reach out to us, we're here to help you. With that, I'll give it away to David. Hey everybody, how are you? My name is uh, David Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a political officer at the US Department of State. Uh, I've been in the Foreign Service now since 2010. Uh, and I was a 2008 Wrangell Fellowship uh, recipient. Um, very happy that FIU, the Wrangell program, the Payne program, the Pickering program, invited me here today to speak to you all. Um, I'm a proud Panther, uh, and I, uh, I graduated in 2004. Um, and um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to just share my experience with you all. So uh, I went to, I'm from Hialeah, Florida. Uh, and so I, uh, I was born there. My parents are of Cuban descent. Uh, my dad coming in 1963 after the revolution, my mom before the revolution in 56. Um, I went to uh, Monsignor Edward Pace High School, uh, which is in Opelika, Florida. Uh, and then I started FIU in 2001. I was originally a, a, an accountant, accounting uh, major uh, because I think, <laughs> I think I had a girlfriend at the time that her, her, her dad made a lot of money doing accounting. I was like, I need to do this. Um, but I, I quickly got bored of, of that very, very quickly. So I found international relations, uh, which back then, because you guys have the SIPA school, I believe now at FIU, uh, back then it was just a department within arts and sciences uh, in the, in the, uh, over in the, the old buildings. Um, in fact, I remember, uh, I used to take classes. My my intro to international relations course were in trailers that are currently where the law school is at. So that's that's how long uh, how long it's been since I've been at FIU. Um, so the reason I I really got interested in in the foreign service was because I took a great course there. Uh, it was called the Art of Diplomacy, uh, and it's a it was a course back then that was uh, it was a public diplomacy officer Sheldon Austin. Who, uh, who ran it as the diplomat in residence uh, at FIU. 
And it was a great exercise in the sense where you essentially created a country team, which is within an embassy, you have, you know, your political section, you have your economic section, your public diplomacy, and you're basically created, you know, they create a scenario for you to work as a team to overcome, uh, you know, a challenging aspect of a foreign policy situation. Um, and I thought it was fascinating. And so working together with people in a room, uh, you know, developing strategies, honing in on your writing skills, it was all fantastic for me. So it really drew me to, you know, looking at this as a potential career. Um, so I graduated FIU in 2004, December 2004. Um, and then I immediately moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, and I honestly, being 100% honest with you guys, my parents came from a very humble place. So I, I'm the first person in my family to ever go to college. So nobody ever told me, yeah, you should be doing internships while you're in school. <laughs> so it was very difficult to get an internship after I had already graduated because what I did was I, you know, I was waiting tables on the side. I had the Florida Bright Future Scholarship, which covered 75%. So I waited tables at the Cracker Barrel and Pines Boulevard, or you know, as no in, in Miramar. Um, and so I was doing that, and then I graduated in three years from college, which I thought was great. But then there was no uh, there was no internship opportunities because you need to be in school for most of the internship opportunities that exist at the undergrad level. So I literally started knocking on doors at, on Capitol Hill after I had already moved to D.C. with $300 in my pocket. Um, and so I just kept knocking doors. And then finally, I got a great opportunity uh, with a House of Representatives office. Um, I was able to work there for five months. Uh, that's, and that's so important, getting your foot in that door. I mean, doing whatever you can to just get that foot in the door. Uh, and having that on your resume, because as soon as that was over, I got my first internship at the State Department in the Office of Caribbean Affairs working on Haiti issues. And that's important later on in the story. Um, and so after I worked on Caribbean Affairs for approximately six months, um, I became friends with the director of the Andean Affairs uh, office. Uh, he was my softball coach. And he basically hooked me up with an internship overseas uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Lima, Peru. And so a lot, of, a lot of what you'll see in this career is about the connections you make with people. It's about the, the individuals that you meet along the way that are going to help you uh, keep progressing and, and making sure that they're mentoring you and like making sure you have enough opportunities going forward. So I do this in, uh, internship in Lima and, and I come back. Uh, and I, th I think I struggled for like three months to find a, a job and I applied for the Pickering Fellowship. And so I applied for the Pickering Fellowship in 2007 and I was selected as an alternate and nobody, nobody, uh, nobody dropped out. So then I, I didn't get it. Uh, I had gotten into the University of Denver and I had to defer. Um, and so what ended up happening is I spoke to uh, he's now a two-time ambassador, Ambassador Brian Nichols. He's the, our U.S. ambassador in Zimbabwe. And he, he just looks at me. He's like, why didn't you apply for the other fellowship? I was like, I didn't know there was another fellowship. So then, and then what I did was I took that time that whole year to, to reevaluate what's important to, to say, how do I put myself in a better position? So I buckled down. And I got a job as a credit manager for a French aeronautics company. Um, I, I worked there for a, over a year and a half. I got to train in France. It was fantastic. And I, re I represented all of uh, the United States and Latin America. I got to travel all over uh, negotiating contracts with individuals. I got to do that for a year and a half. It was a fantastic experience. Um, I started volunteering with the, uh, the Latino Student Fund out in, uh, out in D.C., um, helping kids uh, in from disadvantaged uh, uh, positions uh, and, and socioeconomic situations so that they have a, a leg up on, on the competition in high school. So just doing little things here and there to, to help my community, to help myself personally, to help my, myself professionally. Um, and then I applied for uh, the Wrangle and the Pickering the following year. I was given, uh, I was given both uh, interviews for both. 
Um, and I was selected for the Wrangle program. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was a fantastic day. I mean, uh, you know, they bring you in, you're there with a group of a lot of impressive individuals in that room. Um, uh, it's a little intimidating because for me, you know, foreign languages, I rem I'll never forget. There was a guy there that spoke Chinese, Japanese, and Korean all in this, all, all fluently. And, you know, I speak Spanish, uh, it's, which is great. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you have to understand, it's what Patricia said, that everybody's story is different. Everybody brings something different to the table. And, and so it's important that you, you focus on your personal experience and your life experience and how that translates into how you can make the foreign service a more rich, more diverse institution. That's what we're really looking for uh, from students uh, that are coming in. And I'll say the mentoring is, is absolutely fantastic. I serve as a mentor for two other officers uh, currently, uh, and I'm sure Patricia later on will ask me to mentor someone else, and I'm happy to do so because, uh, honest to God, it's, it's, it's really helped me, and so I have to pay it forward any way that I can. Um, so where are we in the story? So get the Wrangle Fellowship, um, and then for the Wrangle Fellowship, as Patricia explained, your first internship or fellowship experience is on the Hill, on Capitol Hill. So I'm back in Congress, and what's cool about it this time was the first time you work, I, I, I would enter in a personal office, um, but the internship that you do through the, the Wrangle Fellowship is typically in a, a committee office. Um, so you're really getting to work on a lot of foreign service, uh, I'm sorry, foreign affairs type issues. Uh, so I worked in the subcommittee on terrorism, nonproliferation, and trade, mostly looking at sanctioning, you know, sanctions authorities, what we're doing as a government to make sure that people are following international norms and, and guidelines. Um, so then uh, I did that for that summer. I went to grad school uh, at uh, George Washington University. Um, so I, I did my first year there. And then, <laughs> this is a funny story, I, I went off to do my second internship. I had originally selected Venezuela to be uh, to be my internship spot, um, so I was going to go to Caracas, uh, which is fun because back in you know what was it back in two thousand eight or two thousand nine, everything going on with Chavez, like it was a fascinating place. I thought it was going to be interesting, but Patricia calls me one day and says, "David, I need you to consider going to East Timor uh, on your internship," and I said. This is great. I've never been to Africa. East Timor is not in Africa. <laughs> East Timor is in Asia. Uh, so I learned very quickly. Uh, and you know what? Patricia basically said they were having a staffing gap. I had had internship experiences before the Rango Fellowship, working in political sections. So she asked me to go out there. And, you know, I, I, it was a phenomenal experience because all my career had been Latin America, Latin America, Latin America. And that's something really important for all you guys that are considering this career, that they're looking at you to be a generalist. Uh, you're, you're expected to, to kind of have the ability to work in various types of career tracks. Um, so, you know, going out of my comfort zone and going to Asia uh, was, was amazing. I, mean, I, I learned a whole brand new, you know, you, you look at a country where there was Portuguese uh, colonizers, uh, you know, they were having, they had a United Nations mission that was like trying to uh, reestablish democratic institutions around the country. Uh, it, I got to ride in Black Hawk helicopters. It was fantastic. The one of the best experiences I've ever had uh, professionally was at least in an internship capacity. Um, so I come back and I had made friends with uh, the desk officer um, who handled East Timor issues while I was out there. And he actually, um, he actually pitched me to do a civil service job. So in a, while I went to my second year of grad school at GW, I worked in the civil service in the uh, uh, Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs, um, working on Leahy vetting, which is what we do to make sure that we're not giving uh, foreign assistance to human rights violators. Um, so I did that during my second year of grad school. Uh, and then in May, I graduated. In October, I joined the Foreign Service. 
Um, and then I'll just go quickly here. I, I did, uh, I was a vice consul my first tour in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, I was, after that, I went to Tokyo, Japan, where I served as a political military officer. Uh, I got to learn Japanese, which is fantastic. It was, it's a great skill to pick up. Um, and then I went to Lima, Peru again after my internship. And the reason I said it's important to know about that boss, Brian Nichols, is because he was the ambassador in Lima when I applied for that job and helped get me over the edge over other people. So my first boss in the State Department, back when I was an intern coming out of, you know, just coming out of FIU and all this stuff, he helps me 10 years later to get a job uh, in, in DC uh, for my third tour. So in Lima, I was the uh, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs Officer, uh, handling programming for rule of law, sorry, rule of law programming and uh, anti-money laundering. And uh, I just got back a year ago here to DC uh, and I'm, I, I basically do all political affairs for uh, Mexico based in Washington. So I handle internal politics, external politics, uh, human rights issues, trafficking in persons, political military affairs. Um, so, and then on, on a personal note, I'm, I'm married. Uh, I'm married to someone that got the Wrangle Fellowship the same year as me. Uh, we're the only, I think, Patricia, we're the only wrangle, wrangle, yeah, we're the only wrangle, wrangle couple, and we have a wrangle, wrangle baby. So uh, she's two years old, um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a great ride. Uh, I, I'm excited to, 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 to be in this career. I'm excited to represent my country. You know, it's a very challenging time at this point uh, in our country, and I think it's, it's important, especially especially the school we come from, from the community we come from, we offer a great opportunity, uh, you know, to, to, to really represent the diversity of America. Um, and it's not, you know, I'm Cuban American, but we all know Miami's, Miami's more diverse than just Cuban Americans. We have every, every Latin American nation, every Caribbean country uh, that's out there. We are, we are a very, very rich uh, society, a very rich community. I'm very proud to represent, uh, you know, FIU at the State Department. I'm an active participant in HECFA, which is our Hispanic American Employee Association, um, which a friend of mine who also got the Wrangle Fellowship with me, Greg Pardo, he's the president of. So um, I'm, I'm excited for this opportunity to talk to you. I'm going to stop here uh, and I'll, uh, you know, any questions that you guys might have, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, David. That was a, a super inspiring uh, recap of your your path to this point. I, I I don't know if you're seeing the comments from from your your mobile engagement with us, but it's lighting up with uh, with, with everyone. Uh, thank you for sharing that and feeling inspired that Panthers can achieve so much and serve the country in such a way, and and uh, and your resiliency. So definitely resonating with the. The, the, the group here. Um, I encourage the rest of our participants to ask uh, uh, questions in the chat, whether, whether it's uh, uh, questions about the programs for Maria or Patricia or questions about David's experience. I saw one question that will make sure uh, gets answered. Um, as we're waiting for a couple more, I think we have time if she's still on for Rebecca to give a, a quick hello as our current DIR, because I know David mentioned his experience with, with former DIR, so I thought it might be appropriate for her to to say hello very quickly. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I was listening and um, watching at the same time, but took my earphones out. I'm Rebecca Kimbrell. I am the State Department's current diplomat in residence at FIU. Um, I cover South Florida, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands. I am currently responding to lots and lots and lots of uh, requests for information about uh, the fellowships and the U.S. Department of State's uh, 2021 unpaid internship program. So if you are interested in uh, becoming a foreign service officer, learning more about our student programs and opportunities, send me an email at dirsouthflorida at state.gov. I believe Eric put that up on the first slide at the beginning. So thanks. 
Thanks, Rebecca. Um, okay, so we have uh, we have a few uh, questions um, that are already here. Um, Eric, if I may, I would like to emphasize the story uh, that really is very common. Uh, David shared that he applied and didn't get accepted or got to the final stage. A lot of our fellows apply once or twice or even three times. And it's that kind of resilience that we look for. Just because you didn't get selected the first time you tried, I think you should keep trying and try to enhance your application package and also your experience. And that way, you know, you will, you will get through if you really want this. Thank you, Maria. I'm glad that that's emphasized through, through uh, David's experience and, and, and you confirming that from the, the program perspective. So with various kind of levels of uh, complexity of questions, I might read some of the more straightforward ones so we can make sure to get through to everyone. There is a question here about the health screenings and in particular, uh, whether somebody with asthma might have any uh, issues. Is there anything either of you like to say about the health screenings generally that people should know? Um, I'll start with this one. I'll let Maria take the, the next one. So um, all Wrangell Fellows get a medical exam um, as the basis for medical clearance. Um, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there are many uh, foreign service officers who have asthma, so it's a fairly common um, issue. However, this, like any other thing when it comes to medical, really depends on um, your ability to manage it overseas. So if it's something that you have to go to a doctor, you know, once a month or that, you know, you really can't hand, that, you know, breaks out a lot, it might not be the best career. However, if it's managed with medication, if you're, you have a plan to manage it, it's not uncommon at all. So um, as long as I've been doing this, we actually have never had anyone denied a medical clearance, but probably the most important way to think about it is uh, how comfortable are you serving overseas in a place where you might not have immediate access to first class um, uh, medical care. Thank you. Hi, I, I would just add that what, what they're, you know, what they're looking for is is you know there's different classes of medical clearances so you have worldwide available where you can serve anywhere but you know having asthma or something you know even if it's something like mental health or there's a whole other you know host of other things if you have a class two medical it just means that it limits certain countries that are able to provide you uh the, the necessary services you might need um, that's that's just a just a side note, adding on to to what Patricia had mentioned. Yeah, yeah. That said, you do have to have worldwide availability when you come into the foreign service. If something comes up, comes up afterwards, we have a slightly higher standard when people first come in. If anybody has any questions, um, I'll put my email in. You can, particularly if it's medical, if there's something about you know your security that you want to talk about. I'm really glad to do it. I do not share any information with the panel, so you can uh, feel free to be um, uh, very open with me, knowing that I, I will keep it um, confidential uh, if you have any questions. So uh, again, not that's not usually a problem, but we do do security clearances and suitability clearances. They're very similar, um, but suitability is a little bit above um, security because we actually represent the United States, and so how we act uh, outside of our, of, you know, how we act is really important. So um, it's fairly high standard. Uh, the most common thing for young people in terms of uh, having issues with security clearance is use of illegal drugs. It's not that you could never have used them, but it would depend on, you know, when you used them, what kind you used, with what frequency, and with what consequence. So there's no one number that I can get give you in terms of timing. Uh, certainly if you've used within the past year, it's a great time to simply stop and come back maybe a year later and apply because they do take drug use very seriously, even if it's in some place where the state law says, oh, it's okay, because it's still a federal crime no matter what state you are in the United States. So that's something to, to um, think about. Glad to talk. If there's something in your background or anything, please do feel free. Or again, on our website, we have lots of information on um, uh, all of our clearance processes. 
a few questions I'm going to combine here about kind of the application uh, process and varying degrees for, for you two to address. Uh, one is, uh, does it matter which university that uh, they attend for graduate school to apply? Um, another one is about the essay uh, that, uh, that it seems, there seems to be no word limit uh, to list the, uh, or a highlights tab rather than the essay, no word limit to achieve uh, uh, achievements, honors, et cetera. Do you have any advice as opposed to being as detailed as possible or um, focusing on the largest highlights? And how uh, strict is the GPA requirement? Okay, I'll take that. The GPA requirement is very strict. We, um, 3.2 is the minimum. Keep in mind that you will be competing with a lot of people that might have a 4.0. So that is definitely not flexible. Um, what was the other question? Um, also, uh, the highlights tab, I don't know if it's one or all of them have highlights tab. Any yeah. advice for being as detailed as possible or condensing to the, um, the most relevant highlights? Well, you know, if you are a very high achieving individual and you have honors and awards dating back from middle school, you should be uh, choosing the ones that show the, your interest in international affairs or community service or anything related to the fellowship intent. Um, if you have a lot and you want to include them, uh, just think about, is this going to support my application? Is, is it going to enhance? an area that I haven't talked too much about, then yes. Um, but also keep in mind that our selection committee reads hundreds of applications. So sometimes you have to be strategic and how you're gonna make yourself stand out and how you're gonna sound different from the other hundred applicants. And in that sense, you have, and I say this all the time, you have to be authentic. You have to show the real you. And that sometimes means being vulnerable and maybe disclosing some things that you might not be comfortable but you know if it supports your narrative that you're somebody that is truly exceptional that have overcome obstacles that is willing to serve the country and represent it with honor i think that you know this is your opportunity to shine don't don't try to just do it for the, you know, like you have done every, everything, just you, know, you have to put your heart and soul in this application if you want to send out. And about uh, what, what does it matter what graduate school they uh, are applying to? Oh, not at all, not at all. It has to be a U.S. institution, uh, not the London School of Economics, for instance, and it has to be a brick and mortar, not an online program. Granted that now all programs mostly are online, but you know, they have to be traditional programs, not online programs. Thank you. Patricia, would you like to add anything? Yeah, else? and um, again, you can, that's the only requirement as long as it's relevant, but we have uh, schools that are considered partner schools. Uh, FIU at the graduate level is one of our partner schools. And these are programs that agree up front to provide additional financial assistance. And so very often they will cover any costs that we don't. Um, and again, for Wrangell uh, and Pickering, we have over 40. So these are great to look at because, you know, some of them have incredible benefits. So while we may be paying, um, you know, most of the tuition, they'll pay the rest of the tuition and often give a, a, um, a stipend on top of it. So these are really wonderful opportunities. Feel free to email us. We'll be glad to email you the list. You can see it online, but we don't give the specific offers because they change sometimes. So um, yeah, that's, that's another thing. Again, you don't have to go to those programs, but they are a good uh, option. And many of them also will waive your um, uh, need to uh, do an application fee. So that's also a great um, benefit for the program. So yes, Spain also has uh, 33 partner institutions and sometimes being a fellow helps you enter into a program that's highly competitive because these mm -hmm. are very prestigious programs. So if you're applying and we have had cases where uh, the applicant applied and got rejected, but once you got the, they got the fellowship, they got accepted to the program that they wanted to apply to. Rebecca's been doing a great job answering some questions in the chat about specific populations, just to make sure everyone has seen this. We had one question about whether military service, uh, whether there's veterans preference. Uh, Rebecca indicated that as far as the foreign service 
um, a, a entrance in general, there is a, a veteran's preference. And then also we had our international student ask about any opportunities for international students. Rebecca, as we know there, um, noted that U.S. citizens, uh, uh, citizenships required to join the Foreign Service. Is there anything either of you would like to add about veterans applying to these programs or for the international student population and logistics of applying when you have citizenship in the future, et cetera? Sure. I would say two things. First, we, there is no veterans preferences for the fellowships themselves. That said, we have put a huge premium on um, people that believe in service, that are committed to service, that are committed to, to serving this nation. And of course, someone who's been in the military is able to uh, show that uh, uh, very easily. So I think that's, um, that's a positive. Uh, Marie, would you like to take the next one? Yes, uh, I actually think that, you know, we are making efforts to outreach our veteran community because we know that these are people that are service oriented, that have already demonstrated commitment. So, of course, we welcome their application. And, uh, and for international students, no, you have to actually be a, a citizen on the day that you apply, so the day that the application is done. That said, the majority of people that come into our program are either naturalized U.S. citizens or first generation uh, by a slight amount. So again, you can be an American citizen for an hour and we will embrace that. So uh, it's something that we think is really special about the program that we're able to bring in so many people with such rich international intercultural background. So we're very open to it, but the, we cannot um, get around the U.S. citizenship. So the three things we can't get around would be um, the GPA requirement of 3.2. Uh, we don't even round up, sorry about that. Um, the US citizenship and the fact you have to be ready to start uh, graduate school in fall of 2021. The only reason, well actually there's three, but the main reason that we would defer the start of the program would be if, if you get a Fulbright. Um, we will defer for Fulbright. So if any of you are applying for Fulbright, that's important to understand. If there's some type of humanitarian issue, maybe somebody in your family gets very ill or something, we could defer for that reason, or if you have military service. So those are really the only reasons that, that we defer. For the pain, we don't have deferrals. Sorry, but we're nearing the end of our contract and there's no deferrals. I saw a question about dual citizenship would they have a higher chance of being awarded a fellowship if they were to renounce the other citizenship? Um, no, I don't think you have a better chance. Um, it depends on what your second citizenship is. I, I think in some instances you are required to renounce your citizenship, but uh, Patricia, would you like to dwell into that? Sure. So for the fellowship itself, it would not make uh, no, um, it would have no impact because we don't look at security or anything like that during it. We just really look at the thing. So if you're a dual citizenship, if you have dual citizenship, it's fine. It will not have an impact on our selections. Um, certainly when you're getting a security clearance, they will look at it. Um, we have many people who have dual citizenships who get security clearances and are in the program. There could be some uh, cases, and there often are, where they ask you not to exercise your citizenship, which means you don't even have to give it up. Uh, but during the period you're in the Foreign Service, you're asked not to act as a citizen. It is possible that you will not be able to serve in that country because uh, you do not have the same rights because you are a citizen uh, in that country and they can claim you too. So there's a number of different things that, um, that you need to look at with that. However, it should not keep you out of the Foreign Service or uh, the fellowship. Uh, if there's an issue, they will talk to you uh, about it. Thank you. And, and to close, we had two remaining questions and they're very related to each other. One was, what are some of the biggest challenges in the path of becoming a Foreign Service Officer? Uh, perhaps David has something to chime in on, on, on that as well. And the other one, which actually had a second, uh, a seconded, uh, is uh, any recommendations of undergrad level engagements and involvements that can strengthen preparedness for the Foreign Service? I think we'll close on, on, on those uh, questions about challenges and preparation for becoming a Foreign Service officer. Yeah, uh, you know, in terms of challenges, to becoming a foreign service officer, I mean, I think it's it's incumbent upon you uh, to to you know to prioritize your, your personal and professional development uh, going forward. Uh, you know, through the fellowships, that's that's uh, it's a little bit of an easier process because the fellowships give you a path to the foreign service, 
or they provide you a path to the foreign service. Patricia, you can, you can correct me if I'm mistaken. You have your five-year commitment, but you do have to pass the oral assessment before, I think, before the fifth year in That's order correct. for in, in mm -hmm. the in foreign service. Um, so I, obviously, if you're coming in through the fellowships, you will have an, uh, you, you will have a job for you ready uh, after you finish your graduate studies. Um, you know, if you're coming in through the traditional route, uh, I don't know if they've, uh, if you guys have heard from this, uh, but you know, every year they offer the foreign service officer test. Um, I recommend the, that you guys take it all the time. We still have to take it as Wrangell and Pickering fellows. We still have to take the test. Um, so I think it's it's important for you guys to if it's it's free, I offer it in Miami. You guys should just sign up and take the test. Um, and so, honestly, like I said before, in my in my experience, you know, I had prepared myself a lot academically, but I feel for me personally, I, I needed to do more in my community, uh, especially after I left Miami, because I did a lot for my community in Miami. But when I moved to DC, I was so focused on my internships and this that I kind of like dropped off. And so that's why I started, I started kicking that back up again. Uh, I looked for professional experiences. Uh, I looked for professional experiences uh, that matched, you know, something more related to foreign affairs. Um, and it takes longer for you to find jobs uh, in that way, but um, it's, it's important for you to do so. Like I said, I went three months without a job, but I ended up finding a job that really helped me uh, get to the fellowship because a year and a half of traveling around Latin America negotiating contracts is that's that's the foreign service in, in, in a lot of ways. So I think that the challenges is what you the roadblocks that you put up. I mean, you you can overcome anything going forward. And, and I think that's the best way to look at it. And I forgot. Yeah. the second. Can I add something on both challenges and preparing yourself? Learn how to write, practice your writing, refine your writing, um, have people look at it, read several different types of periodicals, just become a good writer because oftentimes we've found that one of the biggest impediments during the Foreign Service Officer Test is the quality of writing and the personal narratives in the essays. We, you write throughout your career. Um, the other one is, um, to do, don't consider any job too um, modest, if you will. I had been a secretary. I um, had to dress up as the Easter Bunny at one point. I worked in a number of different like entry level jobs when I got out of graduate school because they didn't offer the Foreign Service Officer Test for two years after I left graduate school with my master's. But all those different jobs actually contribute to your life skills. You, you get beyond your academics um, successes and you start learning decision making and judgment and interpersonal skills and those types of things that you need to be successful as a foreign service officer as well. Yeah, I would add um, a couple of things to the really excellent comments made by um, both David and Rebecca. Uh, certainly get engaged in your university to the extent that you can. Um, clubs, organizations, volunteer in your community. Um, you know, it's wonderful if you can go overseas to study abroad, but you can get international experience without ever being overseas. So look around and see what uh, may be available. I mean, we're at a very trying time that maybe some of you missed opportunities that you were supposed to have because of this. Um, you can certainly put that in your application. Um, look at what's available. So whether it's working with international students, whether it's emphasizing the fact you're in a really multicultural city. Um, if for some reason you don't have as much in terms of volunteer work or um, uh, work in different student organizations, and that the reason for that has to do with working. So very often, um, because we do give points for financial need, we'll find that some people, if you're working 30 hours a week and going to school full time, you may not have the opportunity to do some of the things that you would like to do. Make sure we know that. That's why you have a financial needs statement. Make sure you give us the tools to be able to look at your entire application and understand you as an entire uh, person. So I would suggest that. But just get involved and uh, find and look at international not just as being overseas but 
all of your life, international and intercultural. We often move between cultures, even if it's not in, in an international context. I think, you guys have, I think you guys have such a, a value added at FIU, having a diplomat in residence there. Uh, I think it's, it's very important that you guys set up, you know, set up a meeting with your, your DIR and, and, and talk about your different options. There, there's, a, there's no, the Wrangle and Pickering and, and Payne Fellowships are not the only paths to the foreign service. There are many, many other ways to get in. Uh, I, I highly recommend that you all apply for the Wrangle and the Pickering Fellowships, but there are different uh, programs in place that you guys can look at because everybody's, everybody's personal and, and professional uh, experience is a little different. So uh, just make sure that you're, you're, you're in communication uh, with Rebecca um, and, and I'm sure she'll give you all the resources y'all need. Great advice. I'm going to close with a plug for the office I used to work for before moving up to DC, the Office of Global Learning Initiatives, because it was brought up that you can get global experience without even going abroad. And I would say, uh, in addition to our School of International Public Affairs, where, where the majors themselves help you do that, uh, global learning is the unit that has perfected how to, from club experiences to events to internships, um, uh, through their Peace Corps prep and global learning medallion programs, have, have really built that into on-campus and online programs. Uh, so I put their link, their homepage up there. Also, their Tuesday Times Roundtable is virtual. I'm actually doing one uh, next Tuesday, their Tuesday Times Roundtable, and I'm hopping over to their 1231 today uh, in just a few minutes, which is on the topic of global health and the importance of social responsibility. So Got to, got to let uh, you all know to, to engage with my friends at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Um, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone who tuned in and asked great questions and who responded with uh, positivity and encouragement to uh, David's story and the other uh, information uh, presented uh, today. Roxana and Janelle are, are seconding and thirding me on the Office <laughs> of Global Learning Initiatives, so appreciate uh, that maybe I'll see some of you in uh, in, in uh, 20 minutes in the round table. Um, I, I'm so appreciative of the great turnout we had today and of the, the time that all of our presenters took and uh, of course this was just a way to get everyone introduced for longer term impact and engagement with, with one another. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much Eric for the invitation and we look forward to hearing from some of you and all of you hopefully and also spread the word to your friends you know if you have somebody that is an engineering major or a biology major tell them about pain absolutely thank you so much and if you're an undergraduate and not quite ready for the fellowship yet don't forget that we also have our undergraduate program too which is a wonderful uh, way to develop a good set of skills uh, thank you so much, David, for joining us, too. It's always great. The best part about all of our programs are the people that are, take part in it. So we're always really, really proud to, to show off our, our fellows. Okay. And thank you all you guys out there. Thank you, FIU. Uh, it changed my life going to that school. And, uh, you know, being able to, to be part of that community was very special. Um, work hard. Everybody there, just keep working hard. And and you guys are going to get whatever you, you know, whatever you guys want in life, as long as you put in the work. Uh, thank you guys for an FIU at the Washington office. And thank you to the Pickering and Wrangle and Payne programs for inviting me today. Great. Have a great week.